Welcome to Physics Twist. This week in science and technology, the Australian science news podcast for the scientifically curious, both neophytes and crackerjacks alike. We are powered by Physics Education, leading science communicators in the education space. It is our job to deliver exciting science content all around Australia, and what better way to do that than with a healthy serving of science jazz right into your brain space. In this episode of Physics Twist, in Untwist, lab-grown meat, what's the go? In On the Green with Quill, it's hip to be a cube, we're talking about wombat poop. And in Far Out with Duncan, we're far in with some Star Trek tech, plus a fact of the week. Hey, Quill. Hey, Duncan. How you going? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm great. Excellent. Um, we've got a new segment today. Ooh, what is it? It's called Untwist. Ooh. You see what we did there? Because it's like physics twist, but then it's Untwist. Oh. And the point of Untwist, Brilliant. it's pretty good, right? Mm-hmm. The point of Untwist is that we are going to talk about something that has been in the media or the sort of public sphere recently mm-hmm. and kind of clarify what it's all about. Yeah. Because a lot of stuff that you see in science, um, about science in the media, kind of confusing and not explained very well. Yeah, so the absolutely. point of Untwist is to clarify and simply explain those stories a little bit better. I love it. That's the idea. So in Untwist mm-hmm. this week... Yep. The first week. We're talking about lab-grown meat. Ooh. Yeah. Great topic. It is a great topic. So, at the moment, obviously, in case you hadn't noticed, Mm. all meat comes from actual real animals. Yes. Okay? But that can change in the future, and I know that you know a lot about this. Well, yeah. So... For those of you that don't know, I am a vegetarian. Mm-hmm. Also, you used to spend a lot of time in a lab, which mm-hmm. is a bit of an interest in and a, following the progression of lab-grown meat. And a PhD as well. Yes. Now, the lab-grown meat thing, idea, kind of work, has been going on for a long time. Um, and basically, people are trying to grow meat in a lab, and mm. this will save us the need for having to kill animals to get that meat. Which would be great. Now, it would be great. How do they do it? Yeah, so basically to grow meat in a lab, what people forget is meat is essentially protein, right? So Mm. you can grow protein in a lab very easily, and this is the basis of how a lot of different kinds of medical research are done, stuff that researches into all sorts of different diseases and whatnot. And the proteins are genetically identical, okay? So genetically, it's the same thing. You're taking a a gene and you're making it, right? So those proteins are going to be the same. Oh, okay. All the different proteins in an animal are identical to each other. No, no, sorry. Oh, okay. But, I mean, if you grow one in a lab compared to if you took it from oh, a I real see. animal, you, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's pretty much exactly the same. So what you are producing is pretty much the same thing. So this idea of clean meat, so mad, ma, uh, meat grown, sorry, map, meat grown in a lab using stem cells. Yeah. Okay? So the cells have come from the animal in themselves, uh, or you can take cells that are um, basically haven't decided what they're going to do, and you can turn those stem cells into what you want them to be. In this case, you probably would want uh, muscle cells, right, to start to grow meat. Because stem cells basically are like a type of cell that hasn't really decided what it wants to be yet. Exactly, exactly. And you can use different kinds of chemicals and different other treatments to make that cell decide it wants to be the cell you want it to be. Um, So basically, this has been going on for a fair while and it's been really pushed in, especially in the US, um, by a lot of people with a lot of money, so like billionaire kind of philanthropists and this kind of thing actors and um, a lot of different people because the idea is both environmentally it could be a lot better um, and also we obviously eliminate the need to have to kill animals Mm. for our meat, which would be fantastic. Um, So there are some claims at the moment that it could be ready by the end of the year. That's what, this year? Yep. You're crazy. Yeah. You're crazy. Yeah, but... There's some scepticism about this. Like well, we're pretty that close to the happen. end of the year yeah. right now, aren't we? <laughs> it's like a few weeks. Yeah. So I think that's unrealistic. Um, You've got six weeks to do lab-grown meat. Yeah, get going. <laughs> um, and real- reality is, is up until now, uh, we don't have anything um, distinctly as a piece of meat. So mm. what we can currently do, and there's no commercial availability yet, but what they can currently do is more to make things like mints, okay? So like a mushed-up <clears throat> kind of meat. But we're not really able to get anything that's more like a steak yeah because the steak has not just like like it's not just the red 
bits, yeah. bits, the marbling exactly. in there as well. So you've got to think about a steak. A steak is a chunk of meat. It's not just all mushed together. It is beautiful muscle tissue. It is connective tissue. It is blood. It is fats. It is all sorts of different things combined. Mm. And a lot of those extra features actually add a lot of the taste and texture to something like a steak. Yeah, sure. Whereas mince, it's kind of just all mushed up, so you don't really notice if it doesn't have the same texture as a steak. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you think that lab-grown meat could resemble that, you know, steak type thing in the future? Is that possible to yeah. reproduce? I mean, I think potentially. I think it would be a lot more a lot more work to be done for that to happen. Mm. I think what you'd need to do is start looking at combining stems, uh, different different kinds of stem cells or different cells to then make some into connective tissue. Yeah. And then potentially make some kind of scaffold that they can grow on to make them True. resemble a more realistic form of like a steak. Or something like that. Yeah. Um, so that I think it, but I think that's still quite a way off. So yeah, I don't, definitely don't think the end of the year. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's a fair few problems with the whole concept as well. Like what? Well, price for yeah. one, because it's still in the proto, very much in the prototype yeah. stage, right? So yeah. like, I've seen videos of people who are trying lab-grown meat in like specialist restaurants. Yep. And there's no way that they can scale this. It's not ready. It's not going to be in Woolies. It's Not ready yet. It's I mean. Like, so currently, you go to Woolies, mince is, as a vegetarian, I'm not sure, maybe $8, $10 a kilo. $8. Okay. Oh, a kilo. A bit more than that, actually, I think. Okay. Yeah. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I buy tofu. I don't even look. Um, so, yeah. yeah, maybe eight, ten bucks, whatever. Mm. 6000 per kilo at the moment <laughs> is the lab <laughs> meat. And the initial ones that were made in about 2013... Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand dollars for a kilo. It better be yeah, good. Yeah. I tell you what, it better be of good. Mints. That's like the best bag bowl you've ever eaten. Yeah. Hopefully. Oh, you'd hope. Or Seriously. at least the most expensive. And then you just slap some dolmia on it. Yeah. Ah, just like mama used to make, yeah? <laughs> so price is obviously a really big factor because, you know, no one's going to switch to these things if they're an outrageous price. Yeah. Um, even with all of the <laughs> ideal of it hopefully being more environmentally friendly and obviously without the whole issue with animals... I don't think there's many people out there that can afford $6,000 for a kilo of meat. I can. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> I, know your, I know your salary. <laughs> <laughs> Quill does um, my pay. <laughs> um, the other thing is also there's currently the best way to grow mm-hmm. lab grown meat um, is to use what's called FBS, which is actually FBS. called FBS, mm-hmm. um, which stands for fetal bovine serum. Mm. Which in essence is sort of like, it's basically like a nutrient-rich growth medium. So, you know, if you've got plants, you need to water them and you give them some, say, fertilizer and that's yeah. what helps them grow. So in essence, when you're growing these cells, you need to put them into some kind of liquid or or a gel matrix yeah, or something okay. like this that's going to allow them to grow. But they need all the nutrients for a normal cell to grow. Yeah. So they're taking this uh, FBS, so this fetal bovine serum. It's got all the things it needs. However, this is taken from fetal bovines. Right. Oh, so right. So it needs to be taken from an animal oh. to grow lab-grown meat. That's not for gum. No. So you can do it without using the FBS. You can use other sources. Um, but this is the best. It's the best way to get the maximum yield and to right. reduce the prices. So Ooh, okay. so that, is it really... That's you know, that's kind of ironic in a, in a way, yes. isn't it? Yeah. So if you're going lab-grown meat because you don't want to um, cause any issues with the animals, then... Mm. Having one that's been grown in fetal bovine serum, which so, does actually kill the animal. It uh, does. Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, is basically... That defeats essence, the whole purpose. Defeats the purpose. Because so, I think most vegetarians are vegetarians because they take issue with the fact that yeah. these animals are, you know, not being killed in exactly. an ethical way. There are plenty of vegetarians who just don't like the taste of meat. Like yeah. my sister, for example, just yeah. doesn't like it. Fair enough. Um, mm. But if you're going to be using this FBS... FBS, yeah. And killing an animal in the process. Yeah. Then what's the point? Yeah. So I hope that it continues to develop. Like it's it's already gone so far in the mm. time that it's been worked on. Um, it's just more about continuing developing it, making it more cost effective, making yeah. sure it's environmentally, um, you know, more environmentally sound and making sure no animals have to be yeah. harmed to produce this no animal harm meat. Absolutely. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a meat eater. Yes. Um, and I do see the problems. With that, mm-hmm. and you know, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect, man. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> but if <laughs> it's good, is it? <laughs> if lab-grown meat were available in Woolies, yeah. even if it was twenty bucks, yeah, for a kilo, you know, twice the price, yeah, 
I'd probably I'd be all over it. Yeah, I'd be all over it like a rash. Yeah, and I think people are willing to choose like a little bit more cost if it means that they're doing a better thing. Mm-hmm. But I think when you get to six thousand a kilo, you kind of pushing your. It's luck. slightly out of my price range. <laughs> like, yeah. I would do five, five, yeah. maybe five, six, but just, six thousand. Just gonna have it? that one yeah. kilo of mints for the next <laughs> six months. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's all you got. Just nibble on an occasion, but mm, yeah. that was sixty dollars. That was yeah, <laughs> delicious forkful. Yeah. Um. So yeah, there's that. Obviously, those issues, but you know, uh, hopefully. It continues to get research. Uh, well, it will. It yeah. definitely will. Um, it's just a matter of time. Maybe, maybe, well, like you said, end of the year? No. Mm. Five years, ten yeah. years down the track, we might see the prices. This is just like it happens with everything. Yeah. It starts off being, look at plasma TVs, to use a, yeah. like a metaphor. Exactly. They started off like $100,000. Yeah. And yeah. now you can buy one for $150 yeah. down Harvey Norman. Yeah. Right? So it's just going to go yeah. right down. But mm. the fact that animals are being killed for their meat is not the only problem with, like, the beef industry mm. as well. So, in terms of raising cattle for the dairy, the yep. amount of resources, the amount of water, the amount yep. of land that Soil, you need for that water, is land. colossal. And also yep. a huge contributor to climate change as well. Exactly. Because, yeah, they, they do use a lot of water. They produce a lot of methane. Mm-hmm. Um, the Just the sheer amount of resources that contributes to that is... Well, it's pretty terrible. It is pretty terrible. Folks, it's uh, it's not good. So for now, I guess the best thing would be try and get free range stuff if you can. At mm-hmm. least those animals have had a good life uh, leading up to when they're eaten. And um, I guess you don't need to eat meat all the time. No. Yeah. yeah I've, like, I've, well, yeah. I've, mm, I was going to say I've cut mine down, but I've actually increased it again recently because <laughs> I'm Balkan. Because I'm <laughs> Balkan. Trying to get massive. But that's chicken mostly. Yeah. But okay, then there's yeah. other problems. So, but, you know, there's always, like, I mean, so my, my husband eats meat, um, but, you know, and so we do cook meat in our house, but, you know, we try and buy free range. And mm. probably he has probably red meat maybe twice a week and, and, mm. and maybe chicken once a week and then the rest of the time we eat vegetarian. So even that makes a big difference for instead of him eating red meat every day of the week. So, mm. you know. It's going to be interesting as well because, you know, you're not going to be able to have a, a steak, a lab-grown steak, like yeah. you said. But if you're going to have lab grown meat in a burger yeah by all means yeah mince yeah, like burger spaghetti yep. all sorts of things that you could still do with that yeah and that would um, make a big difference already apparently maccas are looking at doing it mm. that's mcdonald's for our international listeners <laughs> both of you no <laughs> um so i mean if they get involved then they'll probably can invest a huge amount of money yeah in it, and maybe that'll all speed up the process yeah could absolutely we'll see we'll see anyway that's untwist in the inaugural Untwist episode. Mm, uh, untwisty. Segment. There you go. Untwist. All right, Quill. Yes. We're on the green with you. <sighs> Excellent. Take it away. Well, this week on the green, mm. we've got some animals that wander animals. on the green. Yeah. I like to eat. No, I don't like to. We're not talking like to about meat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Love to eat animals. We're talking about animals we like to cuddle. Mm. Well, maybe not. So, you know when you see something and you kind of see it and it comes up on a news story and then you might hear it on the radio and then it might pop up on social media and you're kind of like, that's kind of cool, but is it real? Mm. Because a lot of fake things go on out there. Absolutely. Now, this is one that's been bait. popping up. Yeah, exactly. Clickbait. Um, and this is one that's been popping up a lot lately and I heard it on the radio recently and then I saw it on some social media as well and then we thought, let's let's have a little bit of a chat about it. Mm-hmm. And this is about wombats. Love them. Love them. And their poo. Don't love it. Well, you might when you oh. finish the story. Okay, tell it's me. it's pretty amazing. Okay, so wombats, right? We know them. They're cuddly little solid units. They are. They are. They're solid ass. I like how you just described it as a unit. They're a unit. <laughs> they are. They can mess you up, by the way. If, they're, if you're like burrowing in their, in their burrow. Thing, Why are you burrowing? I've, just heard, I've just heard burrow. that if you go into their burrow, they charge you and they'll, they'll mess you up. Yeah, I'm imagining you digging like a little dog into a wombat <laughs> hole. Okay, okay, yeah. So if you're burrowing into their burrow, they are very solid. They yes. are very dense. Like uh, if you like run into them with your car, don't not on purpose, but people have you know accidentally. Yeah. Um, usually the car comes off second best oh, yeah. in terms of getting like pulled apart. Often the wombat, unfortunately, also. But uh, yeah, they're really really solid. So marsupials, mm-hmm. which we know, uh, and they carry their young in a pouch. Mm-hmm. And did you know that most marsupials are in Australia, or Australasia, and also in the Americas? I feel like. I know that now that you've just told me it. Mm. Fantastic. <laughs> um, and I, for some reason, I think from when I was a kid, I thought we were the only ones with marsupials, which is not true. Where are the other ones? 
Well, there's some in the Americas. Which ones? Possums and opossums oh, and all those of kind course. of things. Of course, that most people. I think monotremes, if I'm correct. We have all we monotremes, have monotremes, except I think they're also in Papua New Guinea. Well, there we go. I stand doubly corrected. Mm. Anyway, an aside. Wombats are these things. Mm-hmm. They are marsupials, and they carry their babies. Uh, did you know they can also run up to 40 kilometers an hour? That's absolutely terrifying. Yeah. It reminds me of the scene in Jurassic Park. I realize I talk about Jurassic Park a lot, but you know where That's they're okay. being chased by the Tyrannosaurus Rex? Yeah. You just replace the Tyrannosaurus Rex with the, a with the giant wombat, wombat. And they're just like, hit the gas, go as fast as you can. But they can only do it for a very short amount of time. Okay. Yeah, not So long. I have just... no reason to be scared. Yeah, you, and they're actually very friendly. They're not. Oh, they're cool. not unless they're like threatened or disturbed in like a bad way. They won't really like try and charge at you. That's a bit of a myth. That's um, like me. Or you're burrowing in their burrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and really interestingly, I thought also their pouches face backwards. I did know that one actually. That's yeah. pretty cool. And because they're so low to the ground, they can run super fast. But if the patch faced forward, it would basically like a dust collector, Fill right? And the poor little babies would get in stuck in a yeah, dust right. pouch. Man, evolution. Yeah. It's an amazing Brilliant. thing. Brilliant. Um, like when you wear your hood backwards if it's really dusty. You what? <laughs> <laughs> you wear your hood backwards when it's dusty. Hey, you can Are you flip serious? it up and put it over your face. Are you nuts? You can't see where you're going. <laughs> What are you talking about? Do you cut out little eye holes and put on goggles like you're at Burning Man? <laughs> anyway, um, we're talking about wombat poop here. We got sidetracked. Yeah, okay, yeah. Now, they also poop cubes. They poop cubes. 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 So, uh, I don't know about yourself, but I know about myself. No cubes. <laughs> no cubes. <laughs> and... Um, so, actually, it was really interesting. I was reading on LiveScience.com, oh, yep. which was an interesting place to get some infre- interesting science media. And it was actually saying, so why would you think something poops cubes? Yep. Well, if you think about uh, yourself or if you also think about a normal poop in most situations, <laughs> it's coming from a round or cylindrical place. <laughs> and this will produce round or cylindrical <laughs> results. Yes. Uh, so, if you would like to try this at home, um, think about Where trying to squeeze <laughs> toothpaste out of a toothpaste tube. Yep. It doesn't come out as a square. doesn't matter what you do. No, but they're not square. What? Toothpaste tubes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's I see. Okay, point. I see what you're going. So they come out as a cylinder-ish. Because the... The, the hole is a circle. The hole is a circle. Okay, so that's where we're going with this point. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so there's been some really cool new research from Georgia University of Technology, and they actually presented it recently at a conference on fluid dynamics. So oh my God. So pretty high-end kind of research yeah. on the way... Basically, fluid dynamics is really understanding the movement and the laws of how gases and liquids can yeah. move. I'm pretty sure they, that comes into things like F1, when oh. they're in like wind tunnels and stuff yeah, like it's, that. Yeah, it's involved in a lot of important aerodynamics, all sorts of pretty fancy, yeah. fancy things. And this poop theory, in essence, was presented at this conference uh, because, if you think about it, oh wombat no. poop oh no. is a runny mixture. Oh, no. And it only dries up near the rear of its oh, journey. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is, people. So as it's, approaching, cube. <laughs> as it's approaching the rear, it actually starts to dry up. So it goes from being very runny to being less runny. Mm. Now... The reason is that it's mm-hmm. square or cubed, sorry, is like a, if you imagine like a long balloon that clowns make like things out yeah, of, animals. like a, animals or yeah, something like out of. balloon one um, Well, imagine your long intestines, okay? These have more strain on the different edges versus the long sides. So the edge versus the sides. Okay. Uh, yeah. So they have more strain. To make strain. things just make sure that they're, you yep. know, coming. Yep. Keep going correctly. That's right. Yeah. So the more strain is the reason for square poop. Okay. And what's going on is basically what what that means is more strain is not meaning you're straining you to the toilet. If that's the case, you need more fibre. Mm-hmm. More strain means you basically have got less or more stretchy parts of the intestines. So on the like corners or the edges of the of the intestines, not really corners because then you have a square intestines, but in certain spots, mm-hmm. it is less stretchy and in other spots it's more stretchy okay so where it's less stretchy it's going to get pushed into a certain shape and where less it's more stretchy, stretchy certain shape okay you yes, know what yes, i mean so where it's less stretchy it kind of is going to push it out and then and the other and vice versa yep so what happens then is basically you make little blocks little cubes okay because the less stretchy parts force it to have that a shape sharper like a kind, edge. Of, kind of edge yeah, yeah exactly so does that mean that the actual intestine of the wombat 
does have those corners in it. It's not so much that it has the corners. I think more of you imagined like a long balloon, but running along that long balloon were kind of areas where there was more rubber that was tougher to sure. stretch yep. rather like something like that instead. Okay. So it's still the same shape. It's still a normal intestinal shape. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's got like areas where there's kind of, I guess, stronger muscle yep. or something like that. Yep. So it's less elastic so mm-hmm. you get less um, kind of rounding or movement in those areas and yeah. it creates this kind oh, of corner this, pattern. I can't believe we, we're doing this. I know, yeah. isn't it amazing? <laughs> so basically it's less stretchy and you make a little box. And this is not just interesting because it's poop and it's funny, but also because this actually changes the whole new way that how people think they can make cubes. Whoa. So what we can do is right now there's like two ways of making cubes. You either mold it into a cube or you cut it into a cube. Yep. So this could actually o- open up a whole new era in poop-inspired manufacturing. Oh, great. Yeah, I just, came up with Just that what term. we need. Yep. So basically, if you want to make a cube, you could do it in a natural kind of long thing with the elasticy kind of edges or whatever. Yeah. And then make cubes. So rather than having to make molds. So you use cubes in all sorts of so things, So there are right? practical applications for... There are for, practical uh, applications for cube cubes. poops. But they don't have to be made of poop. It could be all sorts of things. You could be making squares of chocolate. Oh, okay. So, so other things. So the factory, instead of like having this like machine that cuts it all neatly, it yeah. can just it can just poop it out. Yeah, <laughs> like a big long intestine that and then, poops out oh, little it squares. Could, it could be runny in the middle of the machine. It only needs exactly. to dry up near the end. Exactly. And then near the rear, it's the right color <laughs> and everything. Well, not just chocolate. It could be anything. But the no, whole idea I think this is, is specifically for chocolate <laughs> manufacturing. It's pretty much and making a whole new understanding of how shapes can be made. Which is pretty fun- uh, fascinating. Out of chocolate. <laughs> uh, or anything. No, 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 just, no just chocolate. chocolate. Well, but, do, do you think they'll do white chocolate too? No, because that would mean they're severely malnourished. Do you think they do... No, I'm talking about, like, the, the chocolate companies. I know, I'm joking. Do, do, do you think they'll do fruit and nut? <laughs> you're a grub. <laughs> but wait, I know what you're thinking, Duncan. Oh, what is that? Why do they need square poo in the first place? Yes! Why do they need square poo? I'll tell you why. Please. Because wombats have really bad sight. And really bad hearing. So if you okay. can't see or hear very well, you know what's really great to let other wombats know that you're there or also for yourself to kind of find where you've been? Is it your poop? A stack of cubed poop. Oh, a nice little stack poop it up tower. As well. Yeah. You're right. Which is why it's with square it. because you can't stack round things, so they, they roll away. But squares do stack. So if you have square poo, you can stack it up and then you know where you've been and other people go, hey, that wombat was there. Yeah, that's not there my stack. Go. That's not my, my stack. Way higher Someone than that. Someone else's stack. Yeah, right. So there you go. A lot clever, to be learnt from clever them. animals. Yeah, we can learn a lot from those guys. From mainly little, about the manufacturing of chocolate, but yeah, and little cubes. Little cubes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Quill, for bringing that to physics twist. No worries. We really raised the bar. I, I love to lower the bar <laughs> at any opportunity. <laughs> oh dear! What a fantastic, fantastic segment. That's right. I know you're always going to bring bring the bar back up with your next um. What, the next segment? Yeah. What's the segment called? I don't know. Far Out. It's called Far Out with Dunk. Far Out, Russell Sprout. <laughs> Far Out. Okay, so, Far Out with Duncan. Welcome, mm-hmm. welcome to it. We're going to talk about planes. Ooh. I like planes. Yeah, me too. Always liked planes. Yeah. Now... Let's just have a think about how a plane actually is propelled, mm-hmm. if you will. Usually yeah. that's with a propeller, mm-hmm. okay? Or it could be with a jet yeah. or a tur- what's called a turboprop, which okay. is basically halfway between, in basic terms, halfway between, like a jet and a um, propeller. Oh, yeah. yeah, cool. So what happens is this basically comes back to Newton's third law, mm-hmm. where you basically push air backwards with the spinning of that, um, with spinning of that propeller yeah. or the jet itself. And the plane goes forward. Of course. Okay, so action, reaction. Yeah. With me so far? Oh, yeah. Perfect. These people have come up with a new type of propulsion that is not a jet, it's not a turboprop, and it's not a propeller. Ooh. It is called, and check this out, Ion Drive. We're going full Star Trek. Wow. In this segment it of sounds Far Star Out with Trek. Duncan. So here's how it works. Okay. So along the front of the plane, basically along the wings. Mm hmm. It has a bunch of wires okay. attached to it, okay, which 
sounds weird already, I know, mm-hmm. but, but stick with me. I'm envisaging some kind of like. Envisaging? Envisaging. I still can't say it. I'm basically imagining mm-hmm. a coat hanger that's been bent into the shape of a plane. Am I, am I there so far? To be honest, you're not far off. Like, Sweet. If, if you took, like, you know, maybe 100 coat hangers yep. and bent them all into like, square shapes. Sweet. And then kind of attach those to a wing looking thing. Cool. That's kind of what it looks all right, like. Let's yeah. continue then. It's like the 2018 version of the Wright Flyer. Cool. Which was the first plane, first powered plane to fly. Awesome. So it has these positively charged wires that mm-hmm. they have. 20,000 volts going through them, okay? Ooh, a lot of volts. Yes, absolutely. And what that does is it does something called ionizing the air, mm-hmm. okay? And it basically strips the electrons from the nitrogen in the air because about 78, maybe 79% mm-hmm. of the molecules in the air are actually nitrogen. nitrogen. Yep. And only about 21% is oxygen. Perfect. That's an interesting little fact there for you. And a little bit of other random stuff. A lot of, yeah, like CO2. So what it does is it strips those electrons from the nitrogen mm-hmm. Uh, molecules in the air. So that's called an ionized particle now. Okay. Okay? What yep. they do now is they'll flow to the back of the plane. Okay. At the back of the plane, you have another wire, or like a lot of them really, that are all attached to what's called an aerofoil. And an aerofoil Ooh. is, you know, when you look at the cross section of a plane yep. wing and how it's kind of like fat at the top and flat yeah, at the bottom. it's kind of got that like little, almost like a rounded ramp yes, shape. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yep. So that now has... Uh, negatively charged wires, Ooh. right? And so you have what's called a electron gradient, which mm. I know big science words, but what that meant, what that means is when you're transferring all of those ionized particles from the front to the back, they gain momentum. Okay, because cool. they're gaining momentum, you're generating thrust. Oh. Thrust is plane goes. How we go? Absolutely fantastic. So what's kind of neat about this is that, well, first of all. It's powered by a battery, and it's powered by a lithium-ion battery, mm. which is the same kind of battery that's in my computer right now and in my Excellent. phone. Okay, so these are like off-the-shelf components. Yeah, cool. It's a 500-watt battery. Um, basically, the rate of consumption, like the efficiency, is comparable to commercial aircraft. Okay, yeah. cool. So, that being said, the prototype is like this, you know, flimsy little thing that's being flown mm. in a gym. <laughs> That's so I cool. should I should also add at this point that it has actually been proven that it can work. Yeah. Okay. So they tested it for the first time. It flew sixty meters mm. in about ten seconds, twelve seconds, okay. something like that. If you compare that, compare that to the Wright Flyer's first flight, which was in nineteen oh three at a place called Kitty Hawk, you know how far they flew? Like thirty six meters. Mm. That's not. Like I didn't that. realize that. Yeah, but it That's was still fun. the first. Power it's almost flight. gliding. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this thing actually flew further than that using this ion drive Star Trek tech, which is crazy. That's cool. So they first came up with the idea, um, like this concept in the nineteen sixties, mm. and they were like, "Ah, probably not going to yeah. work, right?" So producing something called an ionic wind, yeah. which is that momentum gain through the. Yep. gradient. Cool. It wasn't going to be efficient enough, right? They just thought, nah, it's probably not going to happen. Lo and behold, it does. It does. Mwah. Very good. They just had to wait for technology to kind of catch up a bit. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, as I said, very much a prototype. Mm. But in the future, definitely could, you know, we could see it. We could see it. Yeah, now, that's cool. there was an article that I read that said we could possibly use this in drone in drones. Yeah. Guess what? Not going to work. You know why? Why? Because you need the flow of air to be going sideways. It's not going to work if you go straight up. Uh, you, can't, you can't produce that kind of lift. What if you use a drone and you flew it more like a model plane instead of a yeah, helicopter? Was, yeah, so the one that they actually did this demonstration with, it effectively was a model plane. Mm. It just had like a five-meter wingspan. Well, what if they designed one where the plane, the wings can move so that the if you were going upwards, the flow would be going downwards and then that would propel you to go upwards? That could work. Yeah, potentially, potentially could. As far as I can tell, though, it's not going to work in drones. It would no. only work in plane-like devices because you need an aerofoil yeah. in order for it to yeah. work. Yeah. Now, propellers are a sort of aerofoil, I guess, but because mm. they rotate, it's not yeah. going to work in the same way. Yeah. So, whoever wrote that article, bad. Um, but yeah, super cool because again, it's Star Trek tech. This is like we're going to see blue lights and like Blade yeah. Runner stuff after yeah. this. It's going to be. It's going to be cool. A- end of the year. No, not really. <laughs> no, not end of the year. Um, oh, they said that end of the year? No, they didn't. I was just making a joke oh, about the lab. I was going to say, I was like, everyone thinks <laughs> no something's way. happening at the end of this year. There must be some kind of deadline running yeah. or something. Uh, it's the end of the year. Something we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the really neat thing about this is that when you think about it, this type of propulsion has no moving parts. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you just have these 
to be honest, fairly weird looking mm. wires at the front of the front and the back of the plane. But otherwise, no moving parts except for what's called the control surfaces. Yep. The control surfaces are the bit that says, hey, I want to go up, I want to yep. go down, I want to turn left, right, roll, mm. all that sort of stuff. But in terms of the actual propulsion, there's no spinning, there's yep. no jet stuff going on. It's and less all moving parts, wires. of course, means less things breaking. Yeah. As soon as you've got things moving, things break. Precisely. Yeah. You know what else? Dead silent. Ooh. No noise whatsoever. So it could be used especially for, like, spies... And like I mean, other things like you're this. really going down a nefarious kind of route yeah. there. I was thinking more like, oh, we don't have to have a uh, what's the thing called in Sydney Airport? Like airplane noise and stuff yeah, like the, that. They have like a curfew. Yeah, it's that's like true. planes can't fly. Oh, after look, 10. I meant spies like in a good way. Like <laughs> I meant like I was good thinking safe. government spies, which really is a good thing, you know, like monitoring of things. Sure, but not drones. That yeah, not like someone's dodgy drones that mm. are watching people that they're not supposed to. That's but not, yeah. not what I meant at all, actually. I was thinking oh, trains that fly over like just... Iraq and Afghanistan and stuff. <laughs> We're going to cut this. Um, you know Rusty, our resident tech guy? Oh, right, yeah. He, he, yeah that, that Rusty, who you see every day, yeah. um, he was telling me before that the control surfaces, the like left, right, up, down bits, yeah. they could be powered in the future, possibly, by plasma. Ooh, right. Plasma. Plasma. Very cool. Pl- plasma, for those of you who are playing at home and didn't listen last week, mm-hmm. is another type of, like, a state of matter, other yeah. than gas, liquid, and solid, mm-hmm. um, which sounds... Abs- I, to be honest, I don't understand what he's talking about, but it sounds really really nice. It's basically charged particles that can do things by being in... So they would also kind of like momentum. A, a mash of charged particles, if right. that makes sense. You can clean things and stuff using... I used to use plasma cleaning to clean glass for microscopy. Really? Yeah. What the... You've lived this double life. I know. I've got this whole <laughs> other life. <laughs> in my secret spy life <laughs> it was really cool it glowed like this awesome purple like purple space like space star trek color that's awesome yeah, yeah so yeah that's that's what i'm saying you have these like glowing things flying around it's gonna be awesome yeah you basically create a vacuum in there and then all of the charged particles in there um are like this kind of particle soup uh in a vacuum with a vacuum where there's no air it's pretty cool see if we can do that surely we can control planes with it yeah that's all i'm saying um, All right, but cool. hoverboards, oh. just hoverboards? saying. Oh, true. Maybe they could use it for hoverboards. Oh, I didn't think Forget of about making drones. I want an iron-charged hoverboard. Me now we're too. talking. What are you doing later this week? Maybe we should look into this. Building a hoverboard. Yeah, me too. Out of iron-charged yeah. particles. I think we've probably got enough weird like kit in this warehouse yeah. that we can dig something out and make a hoverboard. So much stuff to build. Let's do it. Fact of the week. All right. Fact of the week. Are you ready? I'm ready for the fact of the week. Fact now, of the this, week. This is your fact of the week. I don't know what it is. This is going to be very surprising. Well, okay. It's, <laughs> was that an uncertain <laughs> well? It's not so much a fact, just okay. an interesting thing. Mm. Because I don't know if you've noticed, if you've been outside today here in Sydney, we're having a dust storm. Yes, it is currently Thursday, the 22nd of November. Mm-hmm. And we're having a big old dust storm. Yeah. So, dust storm. Mm-hmm. Big. Massive orange cloud coming over this morning as I was driving yep. up. And it's pretty dusty, not much sun getting through. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I thought it would be interesting to learn a little bit about dust storms. Yes, let's. Okay. So <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> so basically, dust storms in general are caused by often by strong pressure gradients, which basically means low pressure in some place, high pressure in some place, big change. Yeah, often. you see the people on the yeah. news being like, oh, we've got a low pressure zone yeah. over here. And you go, oh, no, yeah. low, low pressure. Yeah. So, in general, low pressure means um, where you've got um, fast-moving air. Mm-hmm. So, when you see those squiggly lines on the on the on the like the Weather Channel or whatever, those squiggly lines with the little points on them are usually your pressure systems. Yeah, and does that mean you, wind? Yeah, well, it's not just wind, but it's also how much air is kind of there, mm. I guess. So, because it's not always windy, right? So, we have high pressure and low pressure systems, and in general, you have fast. Fast air is low pressure Mm -hmm. and slower air is higher pressure Mm -hmm. air. So when you get a difference in these, like a gradient, um, then you are going to get these these changes, basically. So sometimes they want to push up, they push down. Um, But what's also causing these is drought. Okay, so not what's causing the air pressure, but what's causing these dust dust. storms. So when you get these changes in air pressure, but you get that in combined with lots of available dust, Mm -hmm. because it's so dry in droughts, and you've got all this soil 
uh, it's kind of hanging out on top of the ground, but it's not really held in there by grass or trees yeah, or okay. anything like that. I heard this one came from Broken Hill. Yeah. And the only thing I know about Broken Hill, and I'm not even sure if this is correct, but it's dusty. It's dusty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And and so um, these dust storms are often caused by... You might see them out in the deserts and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. these big sandstorms and dust storms, similar kind of idea. Um, we had a really bad one in 2009. Oh, we did, didn't And we? this was a, quite a bad drought year as well. Um, and and that actually was a really bad one. In fact, so far, it looks like it was much worse than what we've had today. But yeah, they we were haven't saying, maybe seen the whole... I don't know. We haven't seen the whole one yet. So. That's true. I heard on the radio they were saying it could be comparable Mm -hmm. to the one in 2009 but to be honest i was outside all day teaching an eco summit which was fantastic Mm. and um barely noticed a thing okay to be honest it was like very briefly it got a little bit dark and otherwise it was like "Eh, yeah it's all right just gray yeah so maybe we don't know who Mm. knows we might have to add in something tomorrow we might suddenly to see we're white with dust again but um so far it hasn't been as bad 2009 so in 2009 uh there was really really bad drought we had one that, again, started in the centre of Australia, and it blew kind of across to all the places on the East Coast. Now, this one was 3,450 kilometres across this dust storm. Now, wow. I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking, how many, how many football fields is that? Exactly, and I knew that's what you were thinking. So, it is around... 37, 729 football Wait, 37, 729, so 37,000. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 729 football fields? Yes. More or less? Yeah. Exactly. Give or take a field. Yeah, yeah right. That's a lot. That's, yeah, it's a lot. 37,729. I think we need another, like, way of comparing this because 37,729 football fields is just blowing my mind. Yeah. Well, do you have another way of comparing no, I that? No, don't. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea. What's How many longer shoes than a football is that? Video? No, but then it's just going to be like a million shoes. Yeah. It just means nothing. <laughs> I wonder how much of New South Wales are covered because that's massive. Yeah. I mean, what is it? It's about from Sydney to, say, the border of Queensland. It's about 900 kilometres. Yeah. So that is would have that's covered huge. almost the whole East Coast, right? That's nuts. Of almost the whole East Coast of yeah. Australia. How does that make any sense? Because it's only 1,000 from here down to Melbourne. Can we get a fact check on this, please? Fact check. So, pretty crazy. That yeah, was a really very, crazy. very big dust on. Pretty much covered the whole east coast of Australia. And you know what was actually quite, not funny, but um, people were a little bit worried that it might have been radioactive. Really? Because, I don't remember that. Yeah, because we have uh, uranium mines out some, in some of the areas of Australia, hmm. and they were worried that the dust oh, that's true. been brought from there might have been radioactive. But they tested it, and there was no conclusive evidence that it was. Mm-hmm. And that dust actually reached all the way to New Zealand. Good Lord. Mm, that's a lot of dust. Good Lord. And that's why it's so important that it's we look poor- after our planet. So, man, that's great, because we export all kinds of things to New Zealand, like mm. sheep and dust. So they can have our dust. <laughs> Eat out dust, New Zealand. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's funny. So I thought that was it's not quite a fact, but I thought it was a pretty interesting it was, little. It was tidbit. nice to recount it. Yeah, yeah. And I also remember those days quite fondly. Yeah, it's my first year of university. Do you remember that dust storm? I remember it because I had to drive through it. Yeah. Oh, did I drive through it? See, I can't remember, but I remember going over the Harbour Bridge, mm. and you couldn't see the other side. That's pretty. It crazy. was just red. driving into like a red. It kind yeah. of reminds me of some kind of doomsday movie. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I. On that, I remember that day very precisely. I was working, I used to work at a restaurant when I was at uni, and I was working, and every time someone opened the door to come into the restaurant, the whole restaurant got coated in red dirt, <laughs> and then we had to wipe down all the tables and wash all the cutlery again, and then oh the next person would come in and open the door. So eventually, I think we pretty sure we closed the front door, made a sign that made them go around into the alley and out through the back door because there was like a shielded area, yeah. and the dust just went into the hallway at the back instead of coating all the tables and cutlery it's and stuff. Nuts, in dirt. isn't it? Yeah. It was insane. It looked like... It's probably yeah, what it's it like crazy. if you live in the outback all the time. We just have no idea because we're, we're sheltered city We're sheltered city, city kids, yeah. even though I grew up in the country, but not the outback. Yeah. But anyway, that was pretty cool. Loved it. Interesting. Thank you for recounting that for me. Fantastic. Loved no it. Worries. All right. Well, that's a wrap on Physics Swiss for this week. So thank you for joining us. And don't forget, you can meet the wonderful people of physics at your school or your vacation centre or even your birthday party, science party. They rule, actually. Um, and to do that, just go to physicseducation.com.au, or I think you can even go to just physics.com.au, which is F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. 
Facebook.com.au. Um, and also, if you like this, please just chuck us a little uh, rating on iTunes. That'd that really, really helps good. us out. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess we'll be back next week. Oh, don't forget to check out the Physics Ed podcast as well. Run by Ben Newsom, CEO and company director, all around nice guy. Mm-hmm. Cool beans. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Catch you next week.